The Boeing 2707 had a lot of potential to be an outstanding commercial flight innovation. But unfortunately, the supersonic plane was scrapped before the public ever had a chance to set foot in it. Originally intended to be the American answer to Europe's supersonic airliner, the Concorde, and the Soviet Union's terrifying Tupolev Tu-144, development for the Boeing 2707 project was highly funded, but the execution failed spectacularly. Technical difficulties, noise complaints, and seemingly just a lack of resources all round contributed to the epic failure of what was supposed to be an exciting new innovation for commercial air travel. So what exactly went wrong? And why aren't we travelling around the world at supersonic speeds? Stay tuned for the full story. And before we take off, please subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to keep up with the latest aviation videos. Cold War Innovation Promises a Fast Future In the 1960s, the Cold War and the space race were in full swing, and all America wanted to do was prove to the Soviets and to the rest of the world at large that they were the most dominant economic and technological force on the planet. Technology was progressing much faster than in previous decades, and from that bred a relentless optimism for the future of flight. Commercial air travel at the time was going through a major transition. It was an era marked by an air of futuristic idealism. The traditional and comparatively sluggish propeller-powered aircraft of the previous generation were being replaced by sleek jetliners which made travelling by plane look a lot cooler, a lot faster and overall made the airline industry feel more future-oriented. Supersonic transport was looking to be the next major leap in commercial air travel. It was a prospect that used to be only dreamed of in science fiction comics and movies. And now, thanks to Europe and the Soviet Union, the dream was coming to life and people were beginning to expect commercial supersonic flight to become reality by the 1970s. While the passion that drove these commercial airline innovations was exceptionally admirable, actually building these supersonic aircrafts would soon prove to be much more demanding than any previous aviation challenges. Yes, these planes needed to be able to travel at supersonic speed, but they also needed to be economically practical enough to produce and sell in great quantities to commercial airlines. Inspiration and Early Development The story of the ambitious Boeing 2707 actually starts nearly a decade before the 1960s. Aircraft manufacturer Boeing had already been participating in a number of small-scale supersonic transportation studies since the early 1950s and had amassed about a million dollars in funding by the end of the decade. By the 1960s, Britain and France had teamed up to develop one of only two successfully realised supersonic airliners. Twenty Concorde planes were made, with 16 of them being used for commercial airline service. In comparison, the Soviets had only developed about 16 Tupolev Tu-144s and retired the plane five years before the Concorde took its final flight. America wanted to toss its hat into the ring of supersonic commercial travel and prove that it could be as successful and innovative as its competitors. By 1963, recently elected US President John F. Kennedy had announced to the world that the United States would be taking part in developing a supersonic jet. This was the beginning of the National Supersonic Transport Program, which saw massive public support and a huge injection of cash. The effort to develop the American Concorde secured a whopping $1.5 billion in US funding, just for the prototypes alone. In today's money, that would add up to over $35 billion, just 9 billion shy of the amount Elon Musk paid for the social media platform Twitter. Ultimately, Boeing was chosen as the manufacturer that would help America win the brand new commercial air travel race, with their prototype seemingly being the one that would be the most viable to develop. But just because the design was most viable, that doesn't mean there wasn't considerable turbulence in actually developing these aircraft. During this period, the developers at Boeing were showing an extraordinary amount of faith in this plane, and who could blame them when you're being backed with the exorbitant funding they were getting? The pressure was on, and Boeing had every intention of delivering results and gaining recognition to shine for their country. The American Concorde Design 
In order to get ahead of the competition, the National Supersonic Transport Program promised that the Boeing 2707 would far surpass its European inspiration, being larger and faster than any commercial aircraft that had come before. The Boeing 2707 supersonic airliner had remarkably ambitious plans to break the sound barrier and travel three times the speed of sound. By that logic, a commercial flight from New York to Los Angeles that would have taken at least seven hours would be cut by more than half with the supersonic Boeing 2707. The aircraft was intended to seat upwards of 300 passengers and had a very unique feature that tried to push the boundaries of the designs an aircraft of its size could have. The plane had what's known colloquially in the aviation community as a swing wing. This means that during takeoffs and landings, the aircraft's wings would pivot out to the sides, which aided in lowering flight speed and allowed increased control over the craft. For supersonic flight, the wings were swung back to move smoothly through the massive speeds the craft would experience as it approached the speed of sound and beyond. And to travel that fast, an aircraft needs an immensely large and powerful set of turbojets to propel them through the air. This is where the aircraft's engineers began encountering some of the more irritating practicalities that eventually prevented the plane becoming a viable passenger aircraft. The four massive turbojets that sat under the back end of the plane were extremely heavy, which then made the plane rear heavy and impractical for air travel. So to try and counter this, the design incorporated an extra set of landing gear. With such ambitious plans of breaking the sound barrier, there needed to be a way to build the plane so that it wouldn't melt under the heat that was generated due to atmospheric friction. If it were a craft made of regular commercial aircraft aluminium, it would disintegrate while in flight. When this problem came about, Boeing needed to quickly figure out a way to design the craft with a titanium alloy that would help the craft survive the trips. The plane was designed to fly much higher than commercial aircraft, which meant that there would be much more cabin pressurization. This resulted in much smaller cabin windows that only measured to be about 6 inches across, but to keep the 300 passengers entertained, the jet was set to be fixed with a revolutionary entertainment system of televisions and headphone jacks. Where it started to go wrong By the mid-1960s, people were expecting the jet to be ready by the 1970s, but it wasn't even close to being finished. These supersonic aircraft trying to break the sound barrier were now approaching insurmountable difficulties. For one, the titanium alloy that was needed to coat the craft was extremely expensive and challenging to work with. The swing wing mechanism only added unnecessary weight to the plane and just didn't have enough benefits to stay incorporated into the design to make commercial flights practical. These setbacks ultimately put Boeing's developers right back to square one. They needed to do a complete overhaul of the design they had spent almost a decade trying to get off the ground. And if these difficulties weren't bad enough, there was another issue with the craft that had the potential to affect as many as 5 million people at a time. These supersonic aircraft generated especially loud sonic booms that at 60,000 feet could be heard from very well over 30 miles away. In 1964, when the Boeing 2707 was in its test flight phase in Oklahoma City, the poor city dwellers were tortured by Operation Bongo 2, this operation was a sonic boom testing that went on every day for more than six months. The sonic booms had cracked windows in tall buildings, resulted in more than 15,000 complaints and about 5,000 cases were filed suing the Air Force for property damages. With the massive pushback from the people of Oklahoma City, there was no choice but to shut down the project early. To add further insult to injury in the massive public pushback against supersonic aircraft development, environmentalist groups warned of the potential environmental harm the Boeing 2707 could inflict. The exhaust emissions that came from these high-altitude crafts raised great concern about nitrogen oxide affecting the ozone layer. This issue would have been forgiven a bit easier if it were a case of special or military aircraft, but because Boeing intended to produce the 2707 on a mass scale, the environmental and local risk factors just outweighed the overall benefit of having these planes in the sky. The final nail in the coffin By the end of the 1960s, Nixon had assumed office, and plans to make supersonic transport commercially available were extraordinarily delayed. 
the national supersonic transport program was now becoming more of a liability. The government was siphoning money into a project that just didn't appear to have the viability that it was thought to have at the beginning of the decade. After several comprehensive reviews conducted by the government, it had become overwhelmingly clear that the best decision was to end public funding of the program. In addition to this, it was just clear that the public's optimism for supersonic transportation had waned. By 1971, the government had cut funding altogether for the program. This would be the final nail in the coffin for any hope of the Boeing 2707 having any commercial production. How are they still relevant today? Unfortunately, supersonic flight never became available to the masses, with only one or two British Concorde planes ever being regularly flown for a very exclusive group of people. But despite the Boeing 2707's spectacular failure, its legacy can actually be seen in the commercial planes of today. The 2707 was the first commercially designed aircraft to feature a glass cockpit. That feature is now an industry standard, with the majority of the commercial airplanes of today featuring that same glass cockpit design. So in the end, the trials weren't all for nothing. What do you think about the whole Boeing 2707 debacle? Would you ever want to take a ride in a supersonic jet if you could? Let's hear your thoughts in the comments section below, and thanks for watching.